Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are in the world. We are back with another Neurodiversity story. So I firstly I want to say a massive thank you to everyone that came on to the show in our previous series. Uh, we, we, I think we had around 30 guests um, all across the world, which was absolutely phenomenal. And we're back. We've created yet another series and we have an unbelievable amount of guests that have uh, that have joined us. Um, and we have uh, the, the amazing Hester Granger who's going to be uh, sharing her story today and obviously the amazing work that she's been doing. So, guys, without further ado, um, I just want you to obviously just let us know where you're tuning in from. So we've decided to continue this series by doing it live, um, but we will obviously be reproducing this into a, a podcast and obviously putting this onto YouTube uh, as well. But um, but just let us know in the comments who you are uh, and where you're tuning in from. And please, obviously, one of the most amazing things about using this as a, as a live platform is to interact with people. What we want to do is obviously make sure that we create a platform where we can get global interaction uh, and you connecting with people across the globe, something that I've done uh, and will continue to do. So uh, if any of you don't know who I am, my name is Darren Clark. Uh, and I've been working in this industry now for probably about eight, nine years, uh, doing kind of global work, helping to raise awareness uh, primarily around dyslexia and ADHD, but now moving into neurodiversity uh, as well. So we also, as well, on top of having incredible guests, uh, we also want to say a massive thank you to our sponsor. We have uh, we have IDL. Uh, so they specialize in uh, software to primary and secondary school globally. Their main goal is to provide learning support to those most in need. Their software is used by thousands of learners across the globe. Uh, and guys, uh, I want to share with you a really short video on the, the incredible software they have and the incredible work they do. And please do check this out. Do you have pupils displaying signs of dyslexia or who struggle with literacy? The IDL Literacy Screener is designed for early indication of dyslexic type difficulties. Our screener is a simple online tool that is perfect for pupils aged eight and over and is easy to administer with individuals or whole classes. The test focuses on the skills needed to understand written and spoken language and to ensure accurate assessments covers these areas in detail. The screener highlights any literacy difficulties your pupils might have, allowing you to provide tailored support to help them succeed. To find out more, visit idlsgroup.com. So that's the IDL. So please do have a look at their website, have a look at the incredible products that they, they offer, um, and please do get in touch with them. They are an incredible uh, organization and doing incredible things. So please do check them out. So without further ado, what I want to do is I want to bring uh, our incredible guests on because this, the Neurodiversity Stories was aimed really around about uh, for, for, for yourself uh, to share your stories and your knowledge around uh, neurodiversity uh, in the workplace, in personal uh, as well. So, guys, without further ado, I want to uh, introduce you to to Hester. Now, Hester, uh, did I did with all of the guests that we have, I do ask if they can send me kind of like a, a bit of a bio uh, of, of what it is uh, that they do. And Hester, I was uh, um, uh, blown away with the incredible work that you've done and that you continue to do uh, on this. So I'm going to really uh, I'm just going to give you a, a, a short snippet. So, so Hester Granger is uh, going to be sharing her story of overcoming challenges. She's worked on some of the incredible shows like The Right Stuff. Uh, also done some incredible work with the, the BDA, so the British Dyslexia Association, uh, up until her current role as co-founder of Perfectly Autistic. But I want Hester to come on and introduce herself properly uh, and, and do a much better job than I probably just have. So uh, and, and, and come on as a guest. And as I said, please jump in the comments as well and let us know where you're from. And if you do have any questions, then please put this on. So without further ado, I would like to introduce you to Hester. Good morning, Hester. Good morning. That was quite the intro. I was just having a little bop there to the music. <laughs> Do you think I should have left it for about 20 minutes? Loved it. I was like, this could be the next 45 minutes. I won't say a word. Hester, thank you so much for being uh, a guest on our show and our first guest back 
on on our show. So a massive thank you for for taking time out of your busy schedule to uh, to join us today. Thank you. No, really lovely to be here, and uh, yeah, really excited for this. So Hester, I know I gave you a, a, a really kind of brief intro within this. Could you just tell uh, our, our viewers just a little bit about yourself um, and uh, and some of your experiences on that? And that would be yeah. amazing. Yeah, sure. It won't be brief because I've got ADHD. Yep. But you know, I do <laughs> Same. It's fine. <laughs> so yeah, so I'm Hester Granger, as you said. I'm now 45 years old and I'm co-founder of Neurodiversity Consultancy Perfectly Autistic. I'm a mum to two children. I've got India, who is 13, going on 30, and Hudson, who is 11. Uh, both are taller than me, both are towering over me already. Um, and they were originally diagnosed um, autistic about four years ago now. And off the back of that process, I would send information to my husband and he would look and go, is that about me or is that about Hudson? And so that's when the sort of light bulb moment was for my husband and he was diagnosed autistic. Um, we launched Perfectly Autistic off the back of that um, using our sort of corporate um, experience. And as you mentioned, I worked at the British Dyslexia Association um, and just kind of used all our lived and learned experience. Um, and then during lockdown, the children were diagnosed with ADHD, as was I, as was Kelly, which quite often happens. I speak to a lot of people um, about neurodiversity and it quite often comes with families or sort of you find couples that are, uh, are both neurodivergent. Absolutely. Thank you so much for the introduction. And, and we'll dive into that if that if that's OK. You mentioned about lived experience uh, and mm -hmm. how, how important do you think that that is? Because, you know, when I, when I started into uh, into this sector, I, I guess it was almost, you know, I'm not a, a teacher or a professor. And I, I feel everyone plays a, a massive part within, mm -hmm. you know, the whole, uh, e e e you know, the whole he ecosystem within this side of it. Um, so I guess I was only bringing kind of what well, I thought at the time only bringing lived experience. But how, how mm -hmm. important? think that is yeah I think it's really important and when we're speaking to organizations we sort of they sometimes might say oh yeah we, we've done some neurodiversity training before and we're like okay that's great like were the people who are training in neurodivergent and they're like no no but they've read a lot and I'm like well, that's great but you know it's really different so I think the lived experience is so important but learned as well so I've done a lot of studying yeah. got a qualification understanding autism I've got on every parenting course there is going you know um so I've done a lot of studying with that alongside but I think you can't you know it's, it's really interesting when we're partners with mind so when we're doing work with them and we're talking about you know myself having ADHD and my partner Kelly my husband you know being autistic and ADHD sort of when you explain what that means to you day to day or maybe in the workplace you see that light bulb go on and they're like wow I had no idea and I think I'm always that's always surprising to me that even now every every client we talk to every company we work with they're like oh I didn't know that or I thought that you would have always known that you had ADHD etc so there's lots and lots I think still to learn for people and, and you're so right do you feel you know I felt when I got diagnosed with dyslexia at the age of 36 I felt um that you know it, it was just the start of something you know normally you think oh you know diagnosis was just uh, you know that's it everything's solved tick but I just felt like I've been, I mean, even now I, I'm on a continuous learning journey. Is that something that you felt that, that y you had? Yeah. And I think especially with the children being diagnosed, we always say we were literally, <clears throat> excuse me, the children were diagnosed. We were handed a report and sent on our way. And it had a couple of websites to go and look at and um, a few books to read. And I can't think of any other condition where they're like, bye bye, best of luck. And you're like, <laughs> what now and that was how we launched perfectly autistic originally it was a facebook community which we've still got we've got perfectly autistic and perfectly adhd which have grown into really lovely global um communities now and that's where it came from because i was like well i didn't know i had adhd so i went down a rabbit hole and that's why i went on every parenting course going every autism um course there was available for every book like just not knowing i had adhd that's a you don't know do you that's the thing, isn't it? it I, I guess there's, you know, there, there's no right route to go down, is there? In, in this sense, you're thinking, you know, if it was something you were learning in, in college or university or something, you go, okay, this is the process that, you know, you go yeah. through to learn. But I guess it was almost like, not a scattergun approach, but it was, it was just trying to understand what can best serve you at that point. Yeah, well, I was thinking, you know, the words of Spider-Man, knowledge is power. So I was kind of like, the more I can take on and the more I can read, sort of like almost through osmosis, I can then understand the children better and I can parent them as a mum better. And then obviously with Kelly being diagnosed autistic as well, he was diagnosed at 44. So he was then trying to learn well, what did that mean 
And we've actually been together since um, I was 24. So we've been together for 21 years now um, and married for nearly 16. And, you know, all you're looking back and you think, oh, that's why we've both moved. Like we've, we've moved house so many times. That's why I've had loads of jobs and got really bored. And that's why. But you don't realise those things. And it's that I'm now 45 and you look back and go, oh, <laughs> you know, <laughs> <been."> yeah. <laughs> you're almost like, that's why <laughs> nobody said and, and I had from some people they were just like not quite I thought you knew you had ADHD but they were like did you not know and I was like no no one's ever said anything I have a high word count <laughs> I talk a lot I have high energy I'm um severe combined ADHD so I'm inattentive and I'm hyperactive okay. um and you know so I'm quite often oh look squirrel away with the fairies oh look there's a butterfly genuinely you know yeah um, and you're nodding but, on. You get yeah, that. I'm, I'm basically called Dory. Is it Dory? You know, like the the fish just yeah. continuously, you know, like oh something, you know, in shiny, shiny or something. <laughs> something nice. Um, and then the inattentive. I'm quite fidgety. I've got a little fiddly, you know, thing here. I'm just kind of, you know, but you, again, you don't realise. And and I've I've got scoliosis. I've got a curvature of the spine which I had operated on when I was um 12. And I thought the reason I couldn't sit still and if I didn't get to move, I would scream was because I have a rod in my back and I was uncomfortable. Okay. So I'm now going through this going, oh, so it's not like, yes, I get achy, but not, it doesn't really affect me massively. I'm like, oh, that it's because I'm literally like, I can't stop. You know, it's really hard to sit still. So, and that's really, that's really fascinating. That's interesting how you, it, logically, you would think that was, that would be, you know, that would be the reason why. So I'm going to take you back because you mentioned that you worked on kind of the hit, you know, one of a massive global show. Was that, was the media side of it something that you were interested in at that, that point in time? What, what kind of took you to that, that journey? Yeah, you know, I think that's actually a good question. I think, so looking back, I've always wanted not to like be on stage or anything but I used to run around the house thinking I was Annika Rice I was seven in a jumpsuit and I'd like got this microphone and I'd be like stop the clock I found the clue and I've always wanted to be on the radio and that was just always a dream of mine so when I went to uni I think it's funny looking back because then you kind of go oh that's a squiggly path I've taken but I went to university um I wanted to do psychology but I didn't get good enough grades I, I knew I never would I had to work really really hard to get the grades I did and then when I went to uni some of the I was doing a few psychology modules that then dropped in the first year so I could pick up media so I was like this is great this is what I've always wanted to do and then I was up at um, Leeds Metropolitan University and there was countdown there was the Yorkshire TV studios up there so I applied for work experience I sent my CV on pink paper <laughs> it's very legal <laughs> then it was on pink paper and a Polaroid photo of me and all that classic <laughs> so good <laughs> The 90s, you? And um, and they came back saying, no, we give all our work experience places at Yorkshire Television to the people on the course at Leeds Uni on the media course. And I was like, well, that's rubbish. That's not fair. So I just kind of thought, well, what do I do? So I'm from Ipswich originally. And in Norwich, there was Anglia Television. So I thought, well, I'll write to them. And I got a job as a runner. And that was my holiday job nice. in between university. And I'm always just that because I have ADHD, I'm like, yeah, yeah, I can do that. Yeah, that's fine. And then I work at it later. It's just when they say giving someone with ADHD the runner's job. It's almost like, Sorry. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You have to solve problems. You don't have to stop moving. You literally wear trainers and you run everywhere, whether that's delivering scripts or whether that's getting guests. Like we had the Trisha show, you know, getting guests food and drinks and stuff like that. So, you know, this was during whilst I was at uni and I was like, this is what I want to do. And I'm quite driven. And I kind of just, I believe that anyone can do anything they want. And people think that's a bit, um not naive but I'm like yeah you can do that and so I wanted to be a television presenter that was my aim yeah. doing these sort of steps to get there and then I ended up um that I graduated from uni back in Ipswich working for an electricity company as you do and um, I just got a, a phone call one day from a woman I used to work with at Anglo Television Caroline who said do you want to come and work with us? I've got a new show starting, a guy called Matthew Wright. He was the Mirror columnist at the time. He's got the right stuff. We would need someone to get the audiences in. So, like, fill the audiences up. I was like, yeah, that's great. So I then would do this mad commute from Ipswich to Norwich, and I just walked miles and miles every day to, like, do this whole commute. And then mm, that went on for a few months. And then I was like, I really want to, like, progress. What can I do? So I became a researcher and then an associate um, producer. 
And then there was, it was years ago, there was what's called the girl in the booth. And so you would sit and then go, hi, this is the telephone number, give us a call on air. And the girl in the booth was off ill. She had to, she had to take the door from are like, what are we going to do? And I went, I <laughs> Perfect I'm opportunity. Good. Yeah. <laughs> I've been waiting for this since I was seven. Like, I'm ready. Um, yeah. And I did it. And I was like, look, if it's terrible, we need to never do this again. <laughs> it, you know, we don't need to talk about it. It'll be one hour and it's all done. And actually, it went really well. I then they let me do it a day a week. And then I got the job. And I worked time as the booth girl. And I would be out about box popping and work daily on, on Channel 5. So, yeah. It's an experience. And, and I think it is. It, it, it's important, isn't it? That, that long-term you know goal that you that you had thinking you know I'm gonna you know you, you visualize it and you think actually this is something that I'm working towards and I think we can get called up in the day-to-day -day sometimes thinking you know it's not happening you know it's not happening like this. I mean we do live in an instantaneous world you know the fact that we yeah. can order something online and it's here it's sometimes the same day yeah. um and and I guess that's hard sometimes to correlate that into real life and think, oh, you know, a career, you know, yeah. <laughs> you know, you have to you have to work at it. But you yeah. must have so much experience from that. Yeah, it was amazing, and I literally still remember like the on air sign would go on, and I'd be like, right, I mean, that's the biggest dopamine hit you can get, you know. And I'd I'd absolutely love it. And then I'd go back and I worked on the show afterwards, so I was the celebrity booker, so I'd be getting all the celebrities in, etc. And it was it was just brilliant. And then it's funny though how things work out because the show was then moving to London. At this point, I'd then met my now husband, then boyfriend. We we went on a date, and I'd known him from years before, and we'd lost touch. And he'd actually seen me on the right stuff it was his birthday and he pulled a sickie that day and he turned the telly on I was like that's Hester and we'd not seen each other for five years and it was before Facebook time and all that kind of stuff and he managed to get through and he was like oh, I don't know if you remember me and his name's Kelly like not many Kellys it's like yeah of course I remember you and we went on a date and that was it three weeks later we were planning to go to Australia together he said I I've got a visa I'm going to Australia do you want to come and three months later we were in Australia and again if my daughter did that I'd go mad but <laughs> Like yeah, you, you start thinking, you know, you have to think logically. And I guess, you know, you think it's, it's, it's I guess it's, to, it, again, just taking those it, those opportunities, isn't it? When yeah. you see these opportunities arising. So yeah. what, were there any kind of telltale signs then um, that, that you you felt? I, I know you mentioned, uh, you, you know, a couple before. Were, were there any others that, you know, like coping mechanisms that you used yeah. around there? Yeah, well, I, I think looking back, there are lots. And genuinely, at the time, that's just what I did. So I, I, you know, I worked in an industry. So I worked at ITV for five years, where you get short contracts. So you might have a contract for three months or six months or however long. Um, the right stuff was a year, which is brilliant. But actually, I then thought, oh, that's just the way I am. That's why I get bored really easily, because I was really used to moving on quite quickly. But actually, I've I'd found a career that suited the way my brain works rather than I was going to say working for an insurance company which ironically I did for a year in my gap year I have had lots of jobs but it, that's the thing I think looking back now and the coping mechanisms are just it, like I really wanted to go and get a different drink you know that ADHD thing of having loads of drinks and before this I thought well I'll go and grab a quick drink well, there's a shop like two minutes away whereas before I'd be like I've got five minutes and I've got to be on this with you oh I'll be fine and I can make it which is ridiculous <laughs> I'm now almost the other way and I've got like an hour and I'm like, oh no, that's cutting it too far. <laughs> so I think you kind of, you learn all these things and, yeah. and like the way we've parented our children, we've always done it in a really neurodivergent friendly way. We've not been super routine. We've been quite chilled. We're quite laid back, but that's almost probably because that's what I needed and my husband needed as ADHD, not his autistic parents. Yeah. That, we almost don't need didn't it's weird how you look back and you find these coping mechanisms that you've just always done and it, it's only when you unpick them you realize that's what it was you're absolutely right and thank you for sharing that and 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 I guess it's that question isn't it you know like when I ask you know what were your coping mechanisms and I get asked this all the time and 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 it's that moment when you start reflecting back and you go mm. oh yeah that is a mm. I guess a, a coping mechanism within this side of it and and you also touched on routine yeah. how how would you say because I guess, you know, we all have to have a certain amount of routine, you know, like uh, get up in the morning, brush your teeth and all the other bits and pieces. And, and then there's a few anomalies where we don't, you know, we can kind of break the mold a little bit. Mm. How would you say that you're quite stringent in, in the routine side of it or now or is it very much the opposite way and find it difficult to, to formulate a routine? 
I find it really hard to formulate a routine. I, the, the way I almost plan my day is around the children and, you know, they're 11 and 13 now, but we still have your rough meals at your breakfast, lunch and your tea and yeah. they fit in things around that. And I, I love the idea of a routine and I come up with routines and all this thing. This I'm an ADHD coach as well and this is what I do with my clients. I'm great at doing that with other people and helping them to come up with a routine. And then when it comes to doing it myself, I can then think of anything to then go, oh, that's a bit, routine feels a bit dull sometimes, but I'm really, really aware I need it. So we've got dogs, but two mad cocker spaniels. So we walk them in the morning, walk them in the evening. So I don't think I have a routine. And then all of a sudden you start to fit the bits around. But I think since being diagnosed, I'm a lot kinder to myself. Whereas before I would just keep going and going and going. And I'm like a Duracell bunny and I get into bed and I'm just asleep within two minutes. I think you, you touched on a perfect point there, um, amongst other things, amazing things as well. But when you mentioned being kind to yourself mm. um, and, and and we hear, you know, so many times about, you know, burnout and, and people, yeah. you know, working too much and, and just really kind of, you know, being completely overwhelmed, you yeah. know, and, 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 and I guess it's trying to understand. And I guess, you know, you probably speak to your, uh, not surmising, but you probably speak to your clients about, you know, like you said, this, this side of it. How, how important do you think that 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 is? Yeah, I think it's really important. I think burnout is a huge topic that's become, we're doing a lot of workshops on burnout, actually, with with quite a lot of corporate companies, because, you know, I, I think the word can be banded about, and you can be really tired and exhausted. And actually, the definition of burnout is really quite severe. And, but I can almost feel my batteries going down. That's how I describe it. I know some people use the spoons analogy and things like that. But I, I always describe myself as a Duracell bunny. I'm 100 miles now from the minute I wake up. And even I'll like sort of say to the children, you know, like, right, I'm about to sit down and you know I won't be moving. Does anyone need anything? Like, <laughs> do, you do, do you do that pre plan then? Do you, you just say, right, you announce that you're sitting down? I announce that I'm a, because I know. And then I almost can feel myself going, oh, you know, like you're in the middle of a big hyper focus and you're like, don't, don't sit down. Don't, no, you sat down. And I'm like, oh no. I'm because done. I understand it now. Whereas before I'd be like, what is wrong with me? And I'd get so exhausted. And I, I found that I was just getting ill quite a lot and nothing terrible, but just colds and feeling a bit, you know, I would be in bed for a few days at the weekend and then I'd be better again on Monday. And this cycle just started to happen. And I just realised that actually, because um, while I was doing Perfect Autistic, I was doing my background's PR and uh, marketing as well. So I was doing that for quite a lot of clients. And I was just like, we can't do it all. And then Perfect Autistic was getting so busy and Kelly had so much, um, you know, so many clients, so much work to do, lots of speaking events, etc. So it, I took the decision in I think sort of November December time last year just for us to go right we just both concentrate on perfectly autistic that is our full-time job that incorporates the workshops the webinars training and the the coaching but also it means we can fit it around the children as well which for us is is the most important thing and, and I want to kind of delve into the you know the incredible organization that you, you you've set up as well as you know when we go back to just briefly when you mentioned about kind of um, you know, well-being and, and finding, you know, certain things, you know, I, I, my, I found that my dyslexia uh, worsens uh, when mm. I'm you know, either overwhelmed or, you know, yeah. just exhausted or tired and, 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 you know, visual dyslexia as well in the sense that, you know, the things moving around on the screen and, and what mm. I've, I've, you know, some of the things that I've learned to, to do is, um, you know, I remember trying to put an email together and it took me, you know, just a response, small, you know, response and email. It took me about 55 minutes. Yeah. And now if I get to that stage, I literally just shut it down, take the dog for a walk or go for a walk or just try yeah. and uh, it's almost like a reset. Um, and I'm not saying that you're, you know, you're perfect when you come back uh, in that sense, but it's just but trying you to might find... do it. You might do it in 30 minutes rather than 55. <laughs> absolutely. You know, absolutely. It? It's just, it's just about knowing those signs, I think. And it's about learning, your ADHD because you said didn't you, you've got ADHD as well it's that kind of just learning how your brain works I think it's that it and it's so interesting because there's so much overlap between the neurodivergent um, conditions um, that actually a lot of them you know I've got this really lovely slide I always do for clients and you know there are so many traits and strengths but weaknesses as well that come from it whereas you say the kind of the the overwhelming you know as you say that that feeling of almost just like well, this is just too much and yeah. I find as well you know I'm 45 now I'm perimenopausal I talk about this you know a fair bit and then that exacerbates the ADHD symptoms like you wouldn't believe yeah. so you're trying to deal with that as well and, and a lot of women are being diagnosed in their 40s having been able to manage and cope and then I sort of describe it that as the wheels are falling off and you can't quite work out why and you're thinking well that's a bit weird but it's because yeah hormones are hitting and I've got teenagers and you're trying to 
juggle all of that. And it's just, you know, whereas you might have been coping, inverted commas, before. I see yeah. this a lot with my ADHD clients. And, and just the wheels are starting to fall off in their 40s. So it's just about resetting absolutely. and coming up with just a, a toolkit to sort of support you. And, and that's the thing, isn't it? It's toolkit. They're absolutely valuable. And I just want to pick up on Martin. Thank you, Martin Griffin. You've, you've put, uh, you said, what about autistic burnout in classic or burnout there is a there is a difference thank you so much for, for sharing this and, and i think you know you alluded to that beautifully hester when you said that it does get the bounded around a lot the, the word you know burnout and how it you know kind mm. of uh, affects in that so thank you so much for for sharing this so so just with the um uh, the, the the early stage of your career then you know thinking about um you know that kind of high driven continuously mm. you know i i guess it was just pure um uh, caffeine and uh you know I I exhaustion you know I I uh mm. excitement that you were running did, yeah. did you find then that you were feeling it, it, the effect not the effects but did, did mm. it kind of affect you in a certain way back then yeah it did and I think so we were I was up in Norwich doing the right stuff and then my husband and I went traveling went to Australia for a year came back and then well, I worked back in Norwich again back at ITV and then we moved to London I was on the right uh, I was on Loose Women sorry and today with Des and Mel and again, really high energy, lots of different bits. And I remember looking back now, you think, oh, my God, you know, I used to have to, I, used to, I was the um, assistant producer and then I became a celebrity booker for Loose Women. So you'd have to book the celebrities and then say, like, if they had a book, you'd have to read the book and things like that. And I remember one time, um, he's an ITV news reporter, I can't think of his name, but he wrote a book about politics. And I was like, I really need to read that um for the next day and it just completely slipped my mind and then I was just like and I remember the editor going absolutely mad because back in the day it was all very shouty I'm not very good with conflict I don't like being shouted at it's very very shouty and I then just did this absolute hyper focus and read the book you know read it skim read it and then I remember him this really horrible editor hauling me up and making me stand in front of the panel of of the loose women and saying, tell them why you didn't read this book. I mean, workplace billion. Tell them why you didn't read this book. And I was like, oh, well, actually I did. And this is what the book's about because I'd like crammed it wow. using my ADHD superpower. I hate that word, but you know, my ADHD hyper-focus. And actually I was able just to go, here we go. So these are the key points. This is what you need to do. But the more stressed I then got, I was finding that was coming becoming a habit and that then led to me, I'd just be really burnt out. But also then you think, well, I'm young and I'm in London and we're going out loads. And, you know, we'd hang out in the green room and drink all the alcohol from the fridge. And you know, it was quite a time to be alive. Um, but also you, looking back now, that kind of slight like panic and that circle that you get into. Yeah. I look back even now that does, I've got that feeling because it, it was so uncomfortable. It was horrible. And after that, I just we ended up coming to Reading for lunch for the day and bought a flat as you do we'd already got a mortgage in place we meant to move to a different place in london and we've got ever had to go to the cash point get all our money out to buy this flat because we'd seen it um as a new build to go and look around and that's when i decided i'm done with telly i got offered a job on 60 minute makeover and i was like that's wow. amazing but i was like i'm done and i moved into pr because i used to speak to a lot of pr agencies at itv and at 28 i got myself work experience at the top end PR agency and started again and that was kind of what I've been doing using the media background but PR and marketing for the last sort of not quite 20 years but nearly so that's kind of how that went along that's, that, that's an incredible amount of experience that you've gained throughout this and 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 you know real hard work I, I can imagine you know we're, we're not talking you know the average kind of uh, you know set hours within mm. this I can imagine it was you know was super high pressure super mm. amount of hours and and like you said that that research that you have to put into something you can't just you know there's only so much we can wing <laughs> things yeah. um but there has to be some substance which you've done you know yeah. massively um yeah. you know, beforehand and it's funny though how I ended up so I was doing the the PR um and I I'm in Reading and the BDA, the British Dyslexia Association head office is now in Bracknell, but it was in Reading and I became their PR and UK PR and comms manager. And so it's really interesting because I, I've sort of always had a connection with neurodiversity without even realising it. Yeah. Um, so that was really quite interesting, learning loads with that and then now being able to take that experience as well 
into the workplace when we train organizations and things it's it's funny isn't it how things work out in the end it, it does and, and like the vast experience that you can bring into this and and i guess you know as we mentioned the lived experience uh you know helps within this massively and also the, the amount of work that you've done uh you know continuously which brings me you know beautifully onto your organization um it, could you tell us a little bit more about uh, about this yeah, sure. So it's perfectly autistic. And we've been going for about three and a half years now. And we are a neurodiversity consultancy, we work with a host of um, corporate organisations. Um, we've got we're doing a year long project at the moment with GSK, we've done some brilliant work recently with uh, the Birmingham NHS Trust with um, training their leaders, they're wanting them to have a really good understanding of neurodiversity. Um, and we work with with lots of different organizations smaller ones as well but i think with our with kelly's got a really strong corporate background and that kind of keeps coming up i think people really like that he can then go into a workplace either do a half a day training session or an hour like lunch and learn style of neurodiversity at work um and yeah it's just been brilliant i think the we just keep getting busier and busier and that's why we're both working on it full time now um i use my background to do a lot of pr with it so we're sort of always being quoted in different newspapers and magazines and things like that because that's still how I get my, <laughs> my as well. it's like, it, it's in you isn't it? it it's something that you you know you thrive off and you enjoy and, and you're good at and, and you can like I said you bring that element into it yeah so we've got you know we've, we've split the roles in in terms of how we do things because I think that was really important but it's really funny because looking back I mentioned that we went um traveling to Australia and we worked together at the Melbourne boat show cleaning people's boots with this amazing um leather uh, like a beeswax cleaner thing I remember it really well and we were like oh my god we just really want to work together this would be amazing and it's taken about 19 years for it to happen again that long you know the long thing and so yeah we, we love working together it's brilliant we either do training sessions separately or they quite often like the sort of the the combination of both of us with our different backgrounds um and as i mentioned with partners with mind we do a lot of work with their mental health at work department and we've done e-learning modules for them we've just done lots of videos um about being small business owners as well and being a lot of neurodivergent people darren you will know this yourself end up being business owners because they are finding their own way rather than working for someone else trying to fit that square peg in the round hole and that's what we do with our training is get organizations to understand the benefits that neurodiversity brings but also how they can support them because yeah. it's not a tick box exercise just getting people in the door it needs to be the support there as well you're absolutely right thank you for sharing that hester and and, and do you feel you know when, when you you know you, you've mentioned a few times you know rightly so that you're very busy and you know and do you think there is more awareness now um uh, around the need especially in the, the you know the corporate sector because i guess when i started doing kind of the dyslexia uh, awareness it was more in the education uh you know side, you know like school talks and I spoke to over a hundred thousand yeah. students and so on and so on and then it, i moved into the kind of the corporate um element of it but do you feel yeah. now that we're you know we're not completely there but there is more of a shift now or you know but still lots more to be done it's a really good point I have to say I think it's a bit of both I think there's definitely a shift and more people are talking about it but I do feel with some organizations it's a quick let's jump on the bandwagon we've heard of neurodiversity we should be talking about it like next month's ADHD awareness month and then and like there's um national inclusion week coming up at the end of September and we're super busy for that and we're, we've got but we now say you need to have you know it's not just for one week or it's not just for national awareness day you need to be doing this all year round and this is what we found is originally a couple of years ago it was the odd talk here the odd talk there but now they're like that was brilliant introduction to neurodiversity we quite often say it opens up pandora's box actually now what else can we do I've used that phrase, so, uh, Hester. I, if you hear me use that phrase, um, <laughs> I, I, I've said I've, I've yeah. done that around kind of um, the dyslexia awareness uh, in October. So we look at you know yeah. uh, October. It used to be kind of a week, and now it's like a month, and and, yeah. and so on. And you're absolutely right. When we've spoken to organisations in the past. Uh, I've said, okay, so what are you, you are happy to go and talk, but what are you going to be doing in November? And you're absolutely mm -hmm. right. It, it does open a Pandora's box because if you have an individual where you've, uh, you know, you've given them the confidence to go and speak to HR mm -hmm. or manager, whoever it is, and they don't have the skill sets to be able to help that individual, and then it stops. Yeah. You go, oh, November is, you know, whatever <laughs> kind of we're doing. 
yeah you got to wait 11 months to talk about it like you know and and that's why I think the the doing the coaching has been really beneficial as well because it's something else we can then offer to clients and um I did um an ADHD coaching course at the beginning of this year there's there's hardly any around so I was really keen to make sure it was a coaching um certificate around ADHD and a qualification in that and so we can then say to um, companies as well look we do this you know we we do we'll do the training we'll do the webinars we'll do e-learning modules for you whatever you need everything we do is completely bespoke but actually you can have ADHD coaching as well to support your um, employees ongoing and you can get that through access to work through DWP so you can actually get um, ADHD coaching funded as well as loads of other support which is brilliant and I think it's about being organizations being able to offer that support not just going oh we've got these people to talk for an hour quick <laughs> and yeah. shut that back again and yeah. that's not helpful for anybody because I think our stories and I'm sure you're the same when you share your story really resonates with people especially with us Kelly and I being parents and that kind of thing and people are like oh and actually a lot of people's children are diagnosed and then they see in themselves oh gosh that really resonates so I think it's really important to have that ongoing support from organizations rather than it being a one-off Absolutely. And I think it's it's creating that environment, isn't it, that um, that enables someone to speak up, I, I guess, and say, you know, I, I need support in this or not just support, but I need some guidance or some understanding, yeah. you know, around this. And I guess you've, you know, in all the incredible work that yourself and Kelly has done as as sparked being able to, to in, you know, put that confidence within the individuals. Do you, do you find that when you go into the workplaces that you not that sort of aha moments, but people actually feel like for the first time someone's speaking to to them for the first time about it yeah and I think also we talked right at the beginning didn't we about that lived experience and I think that's really important I mean I shared a ridiculous post on LinkedIn today about a two kilo piece of pork I had to cook last night because it had run out and I thought I'd cook healthy meals and there I am at 9 30 trying to sort this piece of pork out but it was so late I had to order a takeaway I mean it's just but but people then go Brilliant. you get it you get it yeah. You're like that's perfectly normal. Yeah, I thought uh, I was thinking, what, why, what, what's wrong with the post? <laughs> Not a problem. But, you know, whereas I think someone else rationally would have been like, well, let's freeze that or whatever it is. It's a ridiculous story. But the point is, when I'm coaching people or we're we're talking with organisations, they're like, you get it, you, you understand, you know that you can't pop to the shop to get that drink because you worry that something terrible is going to happen and you're never going to make it back in time. And, you know, it's just having that understanding. And I think when I coach clients, you know, you let them come up with the solutions to, to their answers. But equally, I'm like, I know what it's like having ADHD and you get distracted out the window and you've lost your place with trying to solve the problem yourself. So I'm there to support you. And I think that's what the our Facebook community offers as well, is just that connecting with other people and I think that's what's so important is building a community and that's what's so lovely with your neurodiversity stories is all the comments and all the people that wanted to be part of it because yeah. it's the whole building a village isn't it absolutely incredibly humbled by this and, and like I said this is it, it, the start and what, what the whole creation around this is purely just to try and you know raise awareness and get people talking and, and you mm. know create that environment I think it's you know also important you know I, I think back with an organization so to speak they would have to you know whether um whether there is an issue with uh, an organization that has to think about okay so if we do that process we have to then go into this process and this process i go back to when i was you know uh, in, in retail and i used to uh, every monday there was a five-hour meeting that i had to attend uh, as, a, as a manager within there so we'd go into a room and we'd have literally five hours no windows it was uh, just in this uh, oh environment uh, and you know yeah. why <laughs> <laughs> and it was literally you'd, you'd have to go around each uh person and they'd have to do a presentation on what their department looked like for you know throughout, throughout the you know throughout the week and blah 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 and and it was just i thinking back on it now i'd have to see someone's presentation for 20 minutes sit there and if you were the last, then you'd have to sit and watch all these different presentations around, you know, strategy, sales, shrink, waste, and all the other bits and pieces. And, and you'd have to just sit there. And then when it got to your time, you had to then energize yourself to give this presentation. Yeah. And everyone's sort of like this. But that was, yeah. looking back on it, that was a killer. But also, what an absolute waste of everyone's time. If you've got 10 people in the room, that's 50 hours worth of downtime you've got. And then you're saying you have to do that weekly. Like, I don't know where you work but they need some neurodiversity training don't they <laughs> like you know the whole thing is just it's just about making small and reasonable adjustments things don't have to cost 
loads of money. And sometimes we get that from organizations going, well, how much is this going to cost? It's like, it's not. It's just tweaking the way you send an email or it's what, how you structure meetings or, you know, the office environment. It doesn't have to be all singing, all dancing. You've got to rewrite this whole massive policy. And the thing is, you know, there's sort of one in five people in neurodivergent. 50% of those people don't know it. You got to your 30s. I got to my 40s not knowing us neurodivergent and there's a stat that says um, I think it's about people even if they feel really comfortable and they know that they're diagnosed with a neurodivergent condition it takes them about two two and a half years to actually feel comfortable to disclose that yeah and also whenever we say to people as well you've got clients and you know customers that you're working with who are neurodivergent so it's just a win-win really if you if you understand about neurodiversity I'm blown away by that stat you've said, you know, it takes, you know, a couple of years within this side of it and 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 more reason why we shouldn't just say, OK, can we're, we're talking about such and such this month. Can you come in and do a talk? I mean, yeah. that that's almost impossible to capture, uh, mm-hmm. you know, and create that environment for, for that individual to be able to, to, to speak up. Yeah, but I think the, the important thing and, and what we always make the point of when we do our training and the webinars is that actually by putting these things into place so even if you're not neurodivergent and your five hour meeting which makes me want to vomit quite frankly <laughs> that's just ridiculous yeah, you know, <laughs> yeah but even if you're not neurodivergent you're still sitting there going this is a terrible idea nobody in there probably thought oh i love this Can't wait for <laughs> and by making these changes and these adaptions benefits everybody so that's the that's the point is you don't go, oh, I always say this, you know, Janice, you're dyslexic, Gary, we think you're autistic, we need to do these things for you. You put these things in place and you create a, you know, happy, healthy, more productive workplace for everybody. And by making, you know, if you've got a microwave in the middle of the open plan office and someone's cooking last night's curry or tuna, oh. pasta bake. Nobody wants to smell that. But if you're autistic and you're having a bad day, that can then end up just building up, building up, building up and leading to a shutdown. And then it's just not constructive and it's really bad for people's mental health. You're absolutely right. And and I guess, that you know, that we have this thing. Obviously, we had, you know, the, the you know, the the, the COVID, and the, you know, the global kind of shutdown within this side of it and more more of organisations having to work remotely. And now I guess it's you know, I'm not going to say pro or against, but people yeah. saying, you know, going back into, a, you know, a workplace environment. And 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 you touched on the fact, you know, like someone cooking a meal or, you know, there, there's certain sounds uh, that for me, uh, you know, can rich, literally just ruin the next two to three hours. And it could yeah. just be the most simplest of thing. I, I remember sitting in a in a coffee shop. I go to a coffee shop to, um, to work. I love to see the busy environment, um, but I put my air earpods in and i listen to classical music no lyrics just the instruments and Mm -hmm. that for some reason that just settles me and i can really hyper focus within this i remember it was all busy and i took my earphones out everything was kind of working you know seamlessly as it it was and then a gentleman sat next to me and put some sugar in his coffee and Mm -hmm. stirred the coffee and hit the, the cup it must have been I, I thought it was like three and a half thousand times but it's probably like seven <laughs> but that that thing there I was scrambling for my my headphones I was mm. trying to put the, the music back on and it, it literally threw me mm. so if you put that in an, in an environment where it's continuous yeah these things do need to take into consideration yeah yeah that's the thing and I think it's just you know but it, it's just having the conversations it's talking about neurodiversity at work it's getting neurodivergent trainers in who've got the lived and learned experience it's opening up that conversation rather than just thinking oh god it's too scary and it's too much and I don't know where to start we'll just ignore it I think and I think that's the the important thing and that's what we're seeing a huge increase in is that people are wanting to have the conversations organizations are getting in touch and saying what can you do how can we support our neurodivergent colleagues which is you know you can't say fairer than that can you it's just it's really positive and great to see yeah no absolutely and and I find with with your the organization then have you found um obviously we mentioned about kind of the increased side of it what 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 more do you think because if it was an organization was listening to this and and you know i know we've touched on a few points um and i won't hold you to this don't worry but we, we've touched on a few points of what they can do what do you think yeah. the, the kind of the starting blocks are for them as an organization to start thinking more inclusive around this yeah I, I think the first point is to to realize you have a neurodivergent workforce whether you know it or not we speak to some organizations and they're like yeah no we've just got one person who's neurodivergent <laughs> they're like oh, 
no, you haven't. Um, but they don't realise that. So I think it's even realising that you have a neurodiverse workforce. Um, and I think it's then understanding that actually it's something to be celebrated and the benefits are huge in terms of, you know, offering creativity, offering innovation, different ways of thinking, etc. Um, so I think that's really important. But just that there are some really simple and easy adaptations that pe workplaces can put into place, whether that's the way they, like I said, structure their meetings, or I saw something that's doing the rounds at the moment, where um, it's not a meme, but a little thing I saw on Instagram, where someone had, someone's boss had popped a calendar um meeting it so it popped a meeting into a calendar and it said quick chat and in brackets just put don't worry it's good news and that rather than going quick chat you go oh, I don't know what, what I'm gonna get and I just thought it, it that's how simple it is or even I commented last night to my husband you messaged me Darren saying here I'm gonna send you the link on LinkedIn on the in our DMs and I'm gonna email it to you and I was like that Oh, he gets it. And I think that's how simple it is. It doesn't, that might not seem a big deal to someone else. To me, I was like, that's great because you don't know if I check my LinkedIn messages all the time or you don't know, you know, it's just covering all the bases and it's learning how different people work and different working styles. But as I said, it benefits everybody. You're absolutely right. And, and, <sighs> And that's just it's tr triggered a thought in my mind as well. And I think I saw a post. I, I love the fact that people are sharing information. We can, you know, continuously talk about this. Um, and I better say it before I forget it. Um, in, in the in the fact that, it, that how we live in an instantaneous world now, where everything is fast. You know, we we put some content out, and then someone comments, and then we have to reply in bits and pieces. And we're continuously, mm -hmm. you know, overwhelmed with the the amount of ways that we can be contacted. Uh, I, I guess within this. And, you know, how how do you feel like well, with emails, for instance, we tend to get we tend to treat emails now like it is within social media. So if someone mm -hmm. if I put a post out and someone comments, I, I will you know work through my inbox and all the other bits, pieces and comments. But when an email comes in, it's sort of stacked this, you know, this long. And there's a lot of emotions in this. With the response side of it, there seems to be now, I don't know if it's just me, but there seems to be a certain amount of time that you need to respond within that email, just like a social media post. So it's it, you find it incredibly difficult. I find it difficult responding to an email because I, I'll write it and then delete it, write it. And I put too much, so much emotion into it. I'll write, uh, you know, thank you. Are you having a good day? The dog's great. You know, I literally like all this. And they'll come back going, great, 10 o'clock. And, <laughs> then, then, <you're> like, <laughs> and, and then you're like, didn't even mention the dog, you know, like yeah. didn't even know how their dog is and didn't ask how your dog was. It, it is. And, and and I guess this is, do you find this that sometimes there's a lot of emotion and I, I str yeah. not struggle with emails, but because there's so much. Yeah. I, I think, I think you're right. And I think when you're, we I literally live, sleep, eat, breathe neurodiversity. It's our business. It's our life. It's who we are. It's who the children are. So, and, and it's really emotive. So I get a lot of messages. I was doing a lot of parenting workshops, which I'm going to start again soon. And you get people that go, I don't know what to do. I don't like my child is, is ADHD and I think of this and I don't know what to do. And you get long emails and as you say, so I think firstly, you can either just reply, go great, you know, just to let you know, I've received your email, thank you, in and out of meetings today, but I will come back to you, like a bit of a placeholder. Or um, you, I know some people have like out of offices on where they're just like, you know, just to let you know, I'm out of the office or not even as in I'm out of the office, but just I will respond within 24 hours. And then you're setting your stall out. You just they know then, OK, great. It's going to be 24 hours because it can't be instantaneous. What if you're out at meetings all day or I'm doing training all day or at an event in London or, you know, you can't always be everything to everybody. Yeah. And I think it's just setting those expectations. But the minute you talk about neurodiversity, it's so emotive. And that's the part of the problem with it, isn't it? Yeah, it, it, it is. And 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 I always feel, you know, I, I have a certain system that I, I try to, you know, talk about coping mechanisms. But, yeah, you know, I'm, I'm blessed in the way that, you know, I get so many messages through LinkedIn. Mm. And there's so many. And I think to myself, like, how do you how do you get um, through these? So I end up sort of chunking up. I scroll all the way down and then start working mm. backwards for yeah. these. And then the trouble is that system works until they message you back. <laughs> And then it goes yeah. back into that system, and then you're like, ah, oh, but it's yeah, yeah that's it's what it is. And you say you've then you've spent the time to, to to write a beautifully constructed email, and then you're like, oh, you know. But I know some people are, for example, on their messages on like on DMs on Instagram or on LinkedIn, you can put like I don't know if you can on LinkedIn, but you can do like almost like an out of office reply. But you can be like, that's great, thanks so much. Please drop me an email, and it's uh, you know, or like this inbox isn't isn't always monitored. 
So apologies if I don't reply, but please drop me an email. And then you're going to get the people that really want to contact you versus not that the other people don't want to, but they might have gone, do you know what? I just need to get that off my chest, actually. I feel better yeah. now rather than actually needing a response from you. Yeah, it it is. I, I, I find it, you know, like you said, you know, quite overwhelming sometimes with the amount of messages come in and then you start thinking to yourself, oh, I haven't got back to that person for ages. And then you feel mm. rude. And, and yeah, but but generally it's it's a it's an overwhelming, I guess, of, of all the information that you want to, mm. you know, it, you know, because because the way that I write, I have to put emotion into it. So I have to yeah. it, it then takes energy and then it actually then thinks oh, I can only do so many within that time. Yeah. Yeah. The other thing as well is body doubling as well. I'm always telling my ADHD clients about that, where you just get someone to sit with you. So I we've been doing this for years. I didn't know what it was. I'm like, can you come and do this with me, please? Can you come and do they don't need to do it with you, but they just sit with you. So I will sit there. So we're almost like sometimes my husband and I like sort of um, battleships with our laptops, might be at the kitchen table, bit of a change of scenery, just like, right, have you done that email? Right. You just need a bit of an accountability. Um, I always sort of call myself an accountability buddy for my ADHD. Um, clients because that's what you do is you just and I'll check in I'll be like during the week did you manage to get around to that and I'm like oh my god no <laughs> you know and that's the thing when, you, when you're your own boss and you run your own business that's really hard to find that energy to go oh my gosh but also I think it's if you don't reply within a timely fashion I think that's fine and I think there needs to be understanding on yeah. both sides of things because if somebody took a while to reply to you and then it's like yeah sorry I've not got back to you sooner you'd be like that's no problem that's fine you know I think yeah. sometimes people it's, especially with neurodiversity just want to get it off their chest if it's something personal I think yeah you're absolutely right and I think it's just it, it's, it's setting those boundaries but also having the mm. communication opening the lines of communication to know mm. how, how you know how you deal with with certain things within this side of it as we, we are literally coming up to the end of our time it's flown absolutely flown by I could talk to you for hours um if, if people want to get in contact with you, yourselves and you know your organization how can I mean I will put all this information on the blurb and everything else but how, how can they uh, get in touch yeah well I'm on LinkedIn so come and find me I'm Hester Granger with an I um we've got a website perfectlyautistic.co.uk that's the um, workplace consultancy side it's got loads of free resources loads of blogs on there I've also got my coaching website which is perfectly ADHD .co.uk and I'm Hester ADHD on Instagram and oh I breathed in also we've got the Facebook communities um perfectly autistic and perfectly ADHD as well and people can join the Facebook groups yeah yeah you just have to answer the questions I'm very strict on that and no 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 I, I I sometimes it throws me I join these groups and then it's like oh questions uh, well it okay. didn't pop up does it sometimes and you go where did that come from so yeah they're open to people partners and parents so amazing it's not open to professionals unfortunately you go i work with autistic people or i work with autistic children it's a safe space for autistic adhd people their partners which i think is really important and also parents of autistic and adhd children as well that's wonderful well hester it's been an absolute pleasure and thank you so much for giving up some of your time today to to join us on your university stories and be our, our first guest back for, for our new season no it's been lovely thank you so much and we, we will catch you uh, again soon, Hester. Please uh, get, keep in touch with us and we'll keep in touch with, the, with yourself. Thank you so much, yeah, Hester. Really and I Take will care. speak to you soon. Cheers. Bye-bye. Bye. So thank you so much uh, for our an incredible first guest back, Hester, who uh, who joined us today. And thank you, everyone that joined us for our, our first show back. Uh, we are still looking for uh, for guests. We've had an incredible response. So apologies if we've not got back to you uh, with, with, a, with a date. But we are working through the system now to uh, to get you on to Neurodiversity Stories. I hope you enjoyed it. Please do like, share and follow uh, uh, this page. We will be doing this uh, on a global scale, stage uh, as well. Um, we are looking to do this uh, at different different times and different events um, throughout the year uh, at some point. So take care, guys. Thank you so much for watching. And we will be back next Friday at 11 o'clock with a brand new guest. Take care, guys. Cheers. Bye-bye.